let me first of all say welcome to all of you. My voice is pretty heavy. Come on in. So I am Esther Davis, of course. And actually, we are celebrating women. It's the W luncheon. I wrote an article several months ago that just sort of surprised me because I didn't have any idea that women were moving that fast in the ranks of businesses. So for those of you that did not read the article, let me give you one, one part of it. Black women entrepreneurs have always been a mainstay in Dallas and beyond. Our numbers now have grown to 47% of African American women that are in business between the years of 1997 and 2015. We are a force to be reckoned with. So um, we are going to celebrate women today. And the four icons that are here, Mr. Jones will tell you all about them. Hopefully, uh, if I have the energy, I'll keep this going again. We had this once before when Connie Davis was alive. Connie Davis, Mabel White, and several of the older icons actually had an African-American women entrepreneurial group for contracts at DFW at the time. And they received those contracts by staying together. Clara had to come in for this event because not only was she there, she did her typical thing of taking over and getting it done. So you will hear from her later. Uh, our MC for the evening is, of course, Mr. Fred Jones. Mr. C.B. Whitaker is on one camera, and of course the evanescent Mr. Bobby Flagg from CBS is doing our social media. I need to tell you a little bit about the Esther Davis Show. Those of you that have, have not kept up with us over the last couple of years, we're actually on three channels right now, digital channels. We left PAX TV after six years, and from PAX we went to internet, digital internet. So today we are on VPEN and RUCO. You're going to have to help me here, CW. RUCO. RUCO is an uh, international streaming service in 13 countries. And what happens in the 13 countries is that we own at a certain time in these countries. Good afternoon, Ms. Sheila Tucker. Hey, Deborah. So our audiences with VPEN is Texas, Louisiana. Our audience is with, in, in Florida, is with Ms. Clara McLaughlin and her, her conglomerate of news media because she has newspapers, internet, and uh, television. So we're happy to have you here. Our numbers now have grown respectfully to 6.5 million. With RUCO, we'll top 10 million. And these are basically going to be women and people of color. We can almost assure you of that. Good afternoon, Miss Linda Smith. Hello. Hello. That's our second icon. So I want to welcome you here. We must network because now we're in three states. So with Clara being in Florida and I'm in Texas, we're filling in all the gaps in between. Listen, ladies, women are everywhere, and they're doing everything. We have one national president here, my neighbor, Sharon Millbrooks. What I'm finding is most of the people that are doing things I already know. <laughs> so we are going to put you together and hopefully keep you together for the next decade. Good evening, Mr. Fred Jones, and thank you again for coming to our rescue. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fred Jones. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, my goodness. Indeed. As, as the, as one of the few men that are representative among all these powerful women, I would like to at least give some kind of uh, recognition. By the <laughs> I am Fred Jones, and actually my wife is also one of the recipients, Ms. Deborah Jones. Uh, and it is because of her and her that we are married. <laughs> That's right. Esther Davis and I go back probably 1988-89. She invited me. I was working. At, I've always been involved in fashion. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I've always been in fashion and, and working with youth and, and things of that nature. So I was working at Barbizon at the time. I was one of the 
few male modeling instructors at Barbizon. And Esther called me over to Ken Carter's office <laughs> back then and was telling me about this hair brain idea that she had <laughs> about starting a mail order fashion catalog. And she always talks about how I, I have a look sometimes that I get when people are talking to me and I'm just looking at them like, okay, what are, we doing? what are you talking about here? Let's get through this. And she said I had that look. And she said, it's going to work. It's going to work. Anyway, we've been together ever since. So it has worked. So I think that deserves a round of applause because it's very, very African Americans, especially I'm coming from Cleveland, coming to Dallas, and we get together. And when you get an opportunity, right over there or the back of C.W. Whitaker, you'll see just a brief sampling of all the things that we have done in the city of Dallas and in the fashion world that when you look at the pictures, you kind of forget and you take a lot of things for granted. I was just talking, did not get into the show, I was talking to the lady up front. And she said, I said, this is a beautiful view. And she says, yeah, but I've been working here so long that I don't pay any attention to it. And I said, well, that's the problem. We have to sometimes change our lenses. <laughs> you know, because people come by our home sometimes, they say, oh, it's beautiful, and it's da da da. And I'm looking at it like, really? And I see it all the time. And I forget the nuances and the beauty that our homes and our lives possess, and we just kind of just forget those little minor details. So every now and then you have to change your lens and look at things from a different perspective because that view changes every single day. There's something that's going to be different. Now, with that, let's proceed right into it. Esther gave me a script. Wait. <laughs> 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 and normally when we do a show, there is no script. We don't, we don't rehearse for it. She just says, yeah. just go for it. And right. once I find out who you are, I just kind of just start asking questions and we'll work it. But anyway, this, I, this is an honor to be, uh, do here to this particular script. 2018 Icons of Significance. These, I, these icons, the icons is a celebration of the will, fortitude, example, and courage of generations of women. Their examples were set early in life by mothers, grandmothers, and they have merged victoriously in their communities and beyond. And here they are. Ms. Inez Clark, would you stand? <laughs> From aviation mom to attorney. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the mother of three owns successfully bit, uh, has successfully owned businesses. She decided she could be more and has always wanted to be an attorney. She leased her home in Dallas, enrolled in law school, and focused on her studies. After two and a half years, which is rare, she emerged with her goal and today works in the prestigious firm of Godsey and Martin, who are known on several billboards across the city. Ladies and gentlemen, 2018 Icon of Significance, Ms. Inez Clark. Linda Smith, please stand. No, oh, that's, yeah, yeah, not, that's why we have to reverse. Linda Smith, how many times have you heard someone say they're going to lose weight? Linda, a producer for Showcase Studios, with a successful mediation business with the United States Post Office, but published in her 200-page book, Decided to Lose Weight the Natural Way. Will and determination, she lost 100 pounds. <laughs> Naturally. Today she has a new book on internet, on an internet show encouraging others to follow in her footsteps. Ladies and gentlemen, icon Linda D. Smith. Our third icon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 2018 icons, huh? It's James. What did I say? Uh, Oops. <laughs> he knows what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> icons is significant. It was Sharon Scaife. <laughs> Triumph over tragedy, mind over matter, CEO and talent of SJ. S, graphics for over 20 years, and Teen Graffiti Magazine, a young basketball son who was in his second year of college. Sharon left all her worries and transformed herself into a leading American marathon runner with honors and credits on many trails in the United States. 
On Facebook, she is a champ, a mentor to thousands across the nation. And let me add, she has just authored her first book called I Miss You, Papa, which is in honor of her late husband, Sharon Skate. 2018 icon. She has Deborah Jones, and then she put ha ha, and I was kind of angry. <laughs> Why does she not write up on Deborah Jones? Oh, I don't know. I write up on Deborah Jones. Deborah Jones, icon of significance. <laughs> I have to be brief because I can't get personal, too personal. But anyway, I will. Actually. We have been married over 25 years. We have been in business together for almost 28 years with Jones 2000 and Beyond. We started off as lace gloves with Esther Davis at the old Westcliff Mall wow. <laughs> with Ann Taylor mm -hmm. in her room. We outgrew that and in 1990 we moved to Redbird Mall where we were doing and we got contracted to do all the major fashion shows at the mall. So we had an opportunity to not only do fashion shows, but to pay our models, because the store vendors started paying the models and also started hiring them. So it has grown and grown and grown significantly. She is the mother of three sons. Our oldest son is 48. Oh, you look good. Well. <laughs> and we have six grandchildren. Our youngest son is Trichologist. Very excited to be here among so many powerful women. I'm also a journalist for over 60 national magazine publications with a readership of over 350 million. So today I would like to present my latest publication, which is called Voyage Addictarium, where I'm featured on the front cover. This is for National Alopecia Awareness Month. <laughs> I would like to present one of these magazines to each one of our honorees today, as well as our wonderful speaker today, Ms. McLaughlin. So I hope you all enjoy it. We also have other magazines available for sale, so I do have them available over here. So please support. Thank you. I also want to be sure that we acknowledge Mr. C.W. Whitaker, our video guy and cameraman, who has been with us for a long period of time as well. C.W., if you're not familiar, has been very active in the city of Dallas, and he too is a great, great public servant that nobody ever talks about because he sails under the radar, but he has done a lot of fabulous work, so it's a good, let's give Mr. C.W. Whitaker. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And with that, Ms. Lester Davis will introduce our honoree guest speaker. Yes, thank you. Thank you so very kindly. Uh, Mr. C. W. Whitaker innovates me every time we do a show, which means we did a show, he takes it, within 24 hours I have the show on my cell phone. His innovation is just far above what you're ever going to see in place else because he spent about 25 years with AT&T as the, as the what? 31 years. 31. <laughs> <laughs> so he is the telephone man. Uh, what will happen today, I'm going to ask each of you to give me your cell phone. So once he has the tape ready, 
uh, we will send you a message, and it's going to be the entire show. Yeah, he's going to do some things with it. And that's what happens with Ruku. I'm not really, really up to date on Ruku, but I'm learning. <laughs> My guest is uh, from Jacksonville, Florida. I cannot tell you how much trouble we have been in over the last 30 years. <laughs> I will give you an idea of what she is like. Her theme for life is, if I don't like it, I change it. Clara has, uh, let me give you what I broke down last night. She's had a grocery store. She's from an entrepreneur family. And her family had a grocery store. So at five years old, the family had her labeling the bread, the milk, in the grocery store at five years old. At high school, we're both piano players, and Glenda is also a musician, so we're full of musicians today. In high school, she had a group called the Golden Teardrops right after high school, and marrying another good friend of ours who's now deceased, she wrote a child's book, and this is where I came on the scene with her. The child was black child care, because at the time, there was not a book on the market about black, how to raise a black child. And she had a grandmother and a mother still living, so she raised the book based on their information. But then it gets a lot more interesting because in the 80s, she drove a Rolls Royce because her husband was tired of his car breaking down. So her <laughs> husband says, Clara, go out and buy me a car that will not break down. <laughs> so she buys this, she buys this Rolls Royce. And then she writes a letter to FCC at the time because there were no black women on television. I'm talking about the late 70s. There were no black women on TV in prominent roles. I'll leave it there. She writes FCC, make a long story short, FCC tells her what her greatest need was for television. At that time, it was in Longview, Tyler, that area. She's got a television station in Ty, Ty, uh, Tyler, Tyler, one in Longview in Sharonstown. And what really happened, another challenge comes up, of course, the, the people in that part of the country did not want her with a third television, store, television station. Uh, she moved. That's why, you know, if I don't like it, I change it. She comes to Dallas and started three other businesses. We counted 12 businesses last night that this woman has had. <laughs> and they all worked. So if something happened, in Dallas that she did not like, she went where the next opportunity was, which was down to Florida. In Florida today, just today, she has, uh, I need to bring, I need to back up, I need to go back to the Rolls Royce and when you left Texas. During that time, she was on the cover, on the cover of USA Today, Newsweek, Ebony twice, when they introduced Oprah in the 80s. A clientele of people, you may remember the Corrine Brown incident that's going on in Florida. Her list of friends is just phenomenal. I do have to tell this one story. We had a friend at the Pentagon, a general that just passed away. Clara had the key to his apartment at the, where was it? Okay. <laughs> and we could go there whenever we were doing the shows at that time for the CBC in Washington, D.C., the midnight show. So those of us that were models, we went in, compliments of J. Morrison Anderson, who at that time was with Black America, Black uh, America, Miss America. And we stayed at Tommy Daniels' place. Now, of course, he was supposed to be someplace else, but one night, as fate would have it, we're in the, we checked into his house, his apartment, and then he came in a couple of hours later with a friend. So it got very, very interesting because, you know, we never had, <laughs> and you have to know Tommy Daniels to understand this story. And, of course, Clara was convincing him that you didn't call me and tell me you were coming in. He said, well, you didn't call me and tell me you were already in. So <laughs> but we have had a, a wonderful time. I applaud her for what she did for Corrine Brown, the congressman in 
Florida. I applaud her for what she's done for Willie Gary. Uh, we were at a party for Willie Gary. And, uh, and who? Yeah, it was Willie Gary after he won the $500 million case and he had this huge party. Mm -hmm. And he calls Clara to, it's the first time I've been on two 747s because he had them parked out front. <laughs> and you could walk from one 747 to the next 47 to, the, to where the entertainment was. My friends and all of my guests that are here, please welcome Madame. Clara, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yes. Yes. Um, Esther just remembers more than I do. <laughs> I've forgotten all about Willie Gary, and even though we're still friends, and the fact that the part, I didn't remember his name, but she just called it. <laughs> Tommy Dent. Tommy Dent. Tommy Tommy Dent. 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 You know, I I do make friends because I believe in friendship, and I believe that we as women need to really stick together. So that's one reason she convinced me to come here. She didn't have to say much. We're doing it for women. Black women are always, you know, I did it for women, period, because that's why I started the television station. I did not like the way the television stations were showing women and minorities. So I, that's why I was put up to LCC. And proceeded to get the stations because I thought they never showed us in a positive manner. Only men. I'm thinking, no, they take it from their mamas. I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so that's what made me get into the media was because, well, not I didn't get into it from there. I started from um, at Howard. I was, uh, we didn't have a journalism major when I got there. And I thought, this is the largest rice school in the country, and we can't major in journalism here at Howard. So I went to my uh, director, and he told me, Clara, you tell your classmates, and if they want to go along with you, just you do it. So we went, and I got with the president of Howard, and he said, well, Clara, write it up. So I called different colleges around the country that taught journalism and started a journalism major at Howard. And from there, we had a radio station and a TV station, because Kathy Hughes, who owned the Houston, I mean, the Washington Post, right, gave us the television and radio station because she, she was proud of what I was doing. So she gave Howard the radio and television station. And then I decided that we should have national. And I got real angry about this one because I put out, we had a big conference. And um, the, the FBI used to come by my house all the time. We would say, wait, right back. hey, how y'all doing today? <laughs> they were trying to find out what we were doing as students. And so they had someone at this conference that I had. And we found out because he dropped his wallet and he showed it who's FBI agent. He was pretending to be a student like the rest of us. Okay, so I had uh, I put together a package saying we should have a national black newspaper that went all over the country. And because I was a student still, I didn't have the money to do that. But guess what? USA Today started because from my idea, <laughs> they never gave me any credit for it. But they started USA Today after I put out, we should have a national black newspaper. We still don't have a national black newspaper, you know, but uh, USA Today is not the best national newspaper, <laughs> even though I've been featured in it several times, you know. Um, then from there, what else did we do? Um, I came to Texas because my husband had to start a medical practice and I had to find a place for him to start and they said Houston was the best place. So we went to Houston. Well, it was the best place because my friends at Howard were uh, parents owned the largest catering company in Houston, the Pharaohs. So that's why we started there. And I went from door to door. When I say from door to door, I went to all the beauty, beauty shops, dress shops, everything that women went to. Told them that my husband was an OBGYN doctor and they needed to help him. They needed to see him rather than going to these white doctors. And so we did. They started going, okay, and he had a huge practice, so that's why I was in the battery of boys. <laughs> we didn't have to go into the loans or anything, you know, we were able to get it. So um, then I decided that it was time to build the television station. So I got a station for Longview, Parish, Texas, 
and Denton. And Nacogdoches, yeah, and Nacogdoches is right. So um, um, I decided not to put up a station in two of the cities because the advertisers are advertising in Dallas, and they could see in Dallas what they could see in Longview and all. So I figured that would be a waste of money. So you have to consider the money part, everything. And I decided that was a waste of money because they weren't going to advertise with me. They are going to advertise with Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I would be wasting money. <laughs> so I didn't do it. <laughs> OK. Um, there are so many things that I had to go through in every situation, even for the Longview station. I went on the air, got ready to go on the air. The cable company told me, we can't put you on cable. Why not? Well, we don't have any black people on cable. No. Um, <laughs> black cable space. So OK, so what did I do? I called Cow Dallas Cowboys, because <laughs> they it was, I, I was going, and I opened my station on the day that the Dallas Cowboy was playing, and everybody in Longview watched my station because they couldn't see it on cable. I had to continually fight all the time for everything for us, you know. And I know that may not sound like a good thing, but, you know, because I'm not a big person, but I was a fighting person. Okay, my mama was that so same way. I. Passed out something to you. If Nancy's my niece, she knows how her grandmother was. <laughs> okay, and Mama didn't take anything. I always like to say, tell people that my mother finished high school after we all finished high school. Nancy's mother was like the top of the class in everything. She was an A student. She never made a B. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, so Mama was pushing all of us. She was like 95 pounds or something like that, four feet something tall. And she was a very aggressive lady. Um, she finished high school and college after we had finished high school and college. Okay, so she I always had motivation. You can see that was I was born that way because my great grandmother used to uh, drive us around and say, "See that land there? That's ours. See that? That's ours. That's ours." She would go to uh, auction every first of the month and bid on properties, and she bought all this property from bidding on it, okay? Um, so I, I had aggressive women behind me. I wrote the book, the Black Parents Handbook, was called, the proper name was the Black Parents Handbook, yes, a Guide to Healthy Pregnancy, Birth, and Child Care. It was, and um, I got a hard court brace to publish it, a major publishing company. Everybody was totally shocked that you can get a major publishing company, even my instructors, because you, you, you had to go through a lot to get somebody to publish a book for you. Okay, so um, Mama ran a daycare center, so that was easy for me to write. I was bragging about my daughter, how smart she was, because she could walk and she could crawl and she could do all these things. Grandmother said, so what's the difference? I said, well, Grandmother, you don't do that this early, because I'm reading Procter and Gamp, I mean, uh, Dr. Spark. Good, Dr. Spark and Good Housekeeping, and they didn't tell us we did it that early. <laughs> but black kids did. And my grandparents, my grandmother told me it was nothing different. So I wrote a book for us. <laughs> I did a study and I wrote the book because in my study, I went to Howard and I talked with the chairman of the department of pediatrics and he said, well, we started early. We, we, were, we did a study, he said, in the 40 something. And that's when they found out that we were to it earlier, up to the first two years. Okay, so. Um, I put that in the book, <laughs> okay. Show our real level of progress as babies. Nancy has two children. She knows what I'm talking about because they're so grown. <laughs> you know, those are my little babies. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just that I, when I saw something like that, Esther said, when I saw something that needed to be done, I worked on it. I didn't take no for an answer, you know, and, and I know we can all do that. And I was so proud to know that she had women putting t women together that are aggressive and know we can do it and do it. And I'm grateful to all of you because uh, it's making the progress that I think that we need to make as people, you know. And uh, when I see what's going on today, you know, I noticed that all the black women who are in Congress, for example, are having trouble. I just got a call from Corrine's daughter last night saying, you know, to uh, because they sent me a picture they want me to put in the paper. We need to raise more money because she has a hearing on December 10th. Um, because 
they jail her because the guy, one guy in the court, in here in on the jury decided that she was not guilty, and they got so angry because he didn't, he was not going to vote her guilty. Okay, so um, they took it, put him off the jury. That was illegal. <laughs> you don't do that, you know. Um, so she has another hearing. I, I went I went to the preachers, all the pastors around Houston, Jacksonville and got them to get together and say they're forming an organization. And so they filed a petition, lawyers filed a petition to have a new hearing because there was not a legal hearing. And they put a man off only because he didn't agree with them. You don't do that. The judge claimed that he was going to do something about it, but he didn't. He let it go. So that's another thing we're fighting right now in Houston. And also in Houston, Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. Jackson. I mean, in Jackson, you know, <laughs> I forget where I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, have a black man running for governor. Yeah. We have a um, black man that's um, running for attorney general. Okay. And you know this on the front page of my paper because I put it all on the front page <laughs> to let people know what's going on. We have the lady running for governor in Georgia, Tracy. and Tracy. there's a lady running in Massachusetts. Yes. We're, we're doing, we're yes. pushing yes. us. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's the that's our goal mm -hmm. is to make sure that we can show the talent that we have and we can do it. We've always done it. We started this in this country, and they brought us over here. We started pushing for what we could do. We didn't know how much we could push, but we were pushing hard. And I want to, my goal is to continue pushing. So and I'm so grateful to be here for you ladies to continue pushing. Okay. And I just met this lovely lady right here. I do want to introduce Ms. Joan Hill because we have sponsors in the room. So one is Joan Hill from New York Life. <laughs> and Mr. John Dodd. Yeah. Gracious Father, we thank you for allowing us to assemble here today, one with another. We thank you for the vision that was given to Ms. Esther Day and the follow-up, as well as the follow-through and the tenacity. We thank you for the iconic women that have been presented to us today, as well as each and every woman and man that is around this table. We ask that as we assemble here today, O oh Father God, that you will continue to be in the midst. We ask that you please bless the food that we are about to receive and allow to be nourishing for our minds, body, and soul. We thank you, Father God, for this day, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's uh, Rodney Burchfield of the Burchfield Group. Uh, he's uh, from my hometown. Yes. Our family is from this Starkville, word? Mississippi. Starksville, Mississippi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great and powerful people that come yeah. out of that location. And who is he again? Rodney Burchfield. Yes. Hello, Rodney. It's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you as well. So you came, why? Yes, I am. Um, my good friend Inez, I wanted to uh, stop by and, and support her okay. uh, on the award that she's receiving today. Mm. And you know, I think it's very important that you know, yeah. you know, women like her are, are recognized um, with yes. the table full of other women who, you know, are so successful and, and has so much value, you know, to add to this community and to you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a race Love of people. It. Thank you. We're gonna put you in the center. Thank you so much for dropping by. Next time we have more men here, but.